Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum Online. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Today I'm pleased to welcome guest moderator Kathy Werzer of Minnesota Public Radio and Twin Cities Public Television. Kathy will be talking with our first speaker of the 2020 season, Dr. Victoria Sweet. For more than 40 years now, the Town Hall Forum has offered its programs as a service to the community, and our events are always free and open to the public. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, we're not holding forums in front of a live audience here at Westminster, but instead our speakers will be pre-recorded. We believe, though, that exploring the key issues of the day together from an ethical perspective is now more important than ever. We're simply moving the conversation online until we can gather again in the beauty of Westminster Sanctuary. The forum relies on donations and co-sponsors and individuals for its operating funds. In fact, nearly 85% of our funding comes from individuals like you and me. Although Westminster Church provides generous in-kind support, the forum is a community resource funded entirely by the community. This long tradition has been made possible by gifts from our co-sponsors and friends like you. If you would like to become a forum supporter, you may donate securely by credit card at westminsterforum.org or mail your donation to us at the address shown on your screen. The Town Hall Forum is proud to partner today with Minnesota Public Radio News. This forum is being broadcast today on NPR News Presents 91.1 in the Twin Cities and again this evening at 9 p.m. Thank you for watching today and for joining the Town Hall Forum on its first online-only adventure. And now, let's begin. Thank you so much, Pastor Hart Anderson, and welcome to you all. I'm Kathy Werzer, thrilled to be back hosting the Westminster Town Hall Forum, made possible in part by a generous contribution from the George Family Foundation. I want you now to think about the last time you saw your doctor. How long was that visit? Do you remember? It probably was not long at all. According to a survey taken in 2018, only 11% of physicians said they spend 25 minutes or more with their patients. Most spend anywhere from as little as nine minutes to as much as 24 minutes. What are they doing the rest of the time? Doctors spend more than half of their time, six hours of their average 11 hour day, on the electronic medical record doing data entry and other desk work. Dr. Victoria Sweet has had the luxury of time when working with her patients, some of the sickest and most complicated cases at the Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco, dedicated to caring for the indigent poor. Dr. Sweet has an attentive, methodical approach to medicine, a bit of an old-fashioned approach, one that stresses the body's natural inclination to heal itself with nudges from modern medicine. She's a physician. Don't dare call her a healthcare provider. She'll explain why in just a little bit. Dr. Sweet now works as an associate clinical professor at the University of California, teaching what she calls slow medicine, which is also the title of her best-selling book, Slow Medicine, The Way to Healing. We'll learn more about that in the next hour, especially against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Victoria Sweet, what a pleasure. Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Thank you very much. I think we should start at the beginning of your book because um, you have a, a, a tale in the book about your dad. And it's a cautionary tale. Your dad was quite ill. He was diagnosed as having had a, a stroke, which um, it wasn't. And after reading that story, there seemed that there was a cascading um, series of maddening, maddening events and, and miscommunication. And yet, as you write, you say that judging from his electronic health records, his stay in the hospital looked 100% quality assured. Everything looked so good in the computer, and yet what father had gotten was not medicine, but health care, medicine without a soul. Is it fair to say modern medicine is medicine without a soul? Boy, you really picked exactly the right sentence out of that whole chapter. Um, it's, it, medicine is medicine. Medicine got sort of turned into health care in the 80s when it turned into a commodity to be bought and sold on Wall Street. 
So the distinction I draw is practicing medicine, which is practicing a profession, and delivering or providing health care. And I think um, a lot of the people listening to you will probably, some people will know what I mean when I say practicing medicine as opposed to providing health care, and some people won't. So I'm going to speak to people who don't, right? Because most, the last about 30 years, that's what we've been talking to about. And healthcare is impersonal. It's a diagnosis. It's an electronic health record number. It's a way to get paid. It's it's a, the 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 result and the product. It's really a product of a kind of assembly line. It's very bizarre. And um, so this is the distinction I draw when I say he got healthcare, right? As evinced from his uh, electronic health record. But he didn't get medicine, which is, I, I sort of define as this personal, personal connection between the doctor and the patient where something magical happens when it's good. And had my father had a doctor come into his room uh, and sit down on his bed and look at him, just one look, he would have been able to say, oh, Mr. Sweet hasn't had a stroke. What's he doing here? But I couldn't even get anybody to walk in his room. I could not even get his doctor to leave the computer and walk in the room and look at him. And because of that, because of the electronic health records, once he got the diagnosis of stroke, they can't change it anymore. They can't legally change it because now they've gotten paid sort of uh, instantly by Medicare. So now they've been paid for stroke. They can't go back and change it. It's fraud. So the distinction I draw is this healthcare as commodity versus this personal medicine, which is what patients actually need when they get sick. And it's one of the things that I'm, um, that matters very much to me, that we kind of stop this cascade, not just, in, in a way, putting my father first in the book was a way to, he was a patient, but in a way he represents the whole healthcare system. There's been a cascade that we keep trying to fix it. And the more we try to fix it, the more complicated it gets, the more layers of, um, in, in the way of this person to person uh, relationship. How did we get here? You really want me to talk about that? <laughs> I, you know, from where you sit, I can tell you it, as it turned out. So what, so I'm a doc, I think you, you, you know, I'm a doc, but, um, and I ended up an internist, and I ended up practicing at a very unusual place in San Francisco that was originally the San Francisco Alms House. It's called Laguna Honda Hospital. So by the time I got there, it was a hospital, but it also had the flavor of an old fashioned alms house, which is how we used to take care of patients uh, really before we had modern medicine. So I got an experience. It was one of these old fashioned, we had 1,200 patients, they were all on these old fashioned wards and we were kind of as docs and the nurses we, we kind of were allowed to do what we needed to do for a patient it was a remarkable experience i was there for 20 years and during the 20 years i was there there was this change i'm talking about so when i went into that hospital mm, we still fundamentally have these values of, of the doctor and the nurse and the patient and the doctor and nurse concentrate on the particular patient to do what's right for them mm? by the time i left 20 years later, the whole thing had changed. Hospitals had been bought up by Wall Street uh, companies, bought and sold and closed, and um, pharmaceutical companies were purely for profit, and um, medicine in general was a healthcare that was to be a commodity that was profitable. So I wrote my first book with the idea that this was just a mistake, that something had sort of, that one thing had led to another, and that's how what we'd ended up with. But then with the God's Hotel, and but then I had I had a chance to kind of go all over um, the world speaking about it, and I I could see that this, this no this was not a mistake that people would go oh, read God's Hotel or read the books that other doctors are writing and go like oh my goodness what's happened? Um, I realized that there was something else going on that had actually been a conscious and deliberate change. And finally, I was giving a talk in St. Louis, and I'd been invited by a man named. Uh, Arthur Hale, who was 92 years old, practicing internist. He'd practiced for 70 years. And he told me what had happened. It happened at a particular moment, June of 1976. The FTC uh, ruled that medicine was not a profession, 
but healthcare. It was a commodity and it to be bought and sold on, Mar on uh, Wall Street. So once that happened, everybody started jumping in and buying it and this whole system has been created. That's how I see it. So let's talk about slow medicine. Uh, people have heard, of course, about the slow food movement. Um, is this the medical version of the slow food movement? How would you describe slow medicine? Exactly right. Um, it is, so most people have heard of slow food and this idea of slow food in opposition to fast food. That's actually how slow food got its name. Not so much because it was slower, but because it wasn't fast. So the slow medicine movement really, by analogy, was categorizing the, the, the healthcare that we're talking about, the healthcare as commodity, um, as fast medicine, which has its advantages the same way fast food does. But what we need is um, a medicine that isn't so much slower in time, but it has the same feeling tone as the slow food movement. So it pays attention. It recognizes that people are individual and not boxes on a conveyor belt. And the slow food movement was, um, uh, gave birth in some ways to the slow medicine movement. And what was interesting is when I thought of calling the medicine I'd been able to practice at this unusual hospital, slow medicine, there were at least five other doctors around the world who within the same few months came up with the same idea. So the idea behind slow medicine is that mm, fast medicine is kind of industrial. It's based on the model of body as a machine and doctor as a mechanic. And that when you get sick, it's because something's broken and the job of the doctor is to find it, repair it, or replace it. And it's a very useful model. I mean, when it works, it works great. But there's another model of um, the body, which is the body as a plant. And this is actually a very old model that goes back many, many hundreds of years to when um, medicine was actually practiced by monks and nuns in monasteries as a vocation, as a calling. And in that model, mm, the body is more like a plant and the doctor is more like a gardener. So this is a very, uh, and that, that I would say was the essence of the way I look at slow, at slow medicine, is that the difference between the body as machine and the body as plant is that, in essence, somebody has to fix a broken machine. Right? But a plant can heal itself. And so the job of the doctor in that isn't to find what's broken and fix it, but to remove what's in the way of the body healing itself. Now, what could be in the way might be cancer. And for that, the tools of fast medicine would be great, right? It could be a blocked artery. But after that thing that's in the way has been removed, then the doctor uses the other ways of slow medicine, which are Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merryman. That's how they called it in the Middle Ages. I love that. Yeah, they used to say, even when you have no other doctors to hand, even when you have no other doctor, you always have three doctors to hand. Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merryman. And so those are the pieces that modern medicine, fast medicine, healthcare has left out of the equation. So it's not so much we should replace fast medicine with slow medicine, is that we need to keep our wonderful fast medicine, but we really need to remember the slow medicine that we had before we had fast medicine and bring its perspective back so that we get, we get both perspectives, the body as machine and the body as plant, the doctor as mechanic and the doctor as gardener. That makes sense, but of course in medical school, students are taught really to be the mechanic, are they not? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. However, they should be taught that because that's the actual, that's the technique, the technology. I, I found it personally very useful in medical school. I mean, I was a, a skeptic, not to say a cynic, um, and learning, really, really, really learning the body as machine was tremendously helpful to me. Even, even well, I would say, I think you need to know that. But once you've learned that, especially if you're a medical student, you become an intern, you become a resident, then you go out and practice, you start realizing that there's, that it doesn't cover all the bases, right? That body as machine is wonderful. If, you, if I can find what's wrong with you and fix it, I should do it. But there's this whole other thing that happens, usually before you get sick, 
and after you get sick, where the mechanical model of the body is not useful. And so what happens is it's most docs, after their training, they start realizing that, that there's a whole other piece that they've missed. The difference between sitting on a bed with a patient and sitting in front of the computer. That when, and most docs as they get older and they get more experienced, they start realizing that sometimes, the, sometimes they don't have to do anything at all. I mean, when I was at Laguna Honda, especially the first few years, and I was much younger, right? And I was still kind of imbued with the faith that I knew what to do and how to do it. And then the longer I was there over these 20 years, I found that I was doing less and less with my patients. And they were getting better and better. It was kind of uncanny. So I think it's fine that medical students learn really well the model of bodies machine, really well their technologies, but that they keep some part of them separate and notice when that model isn't working or isn't quite the right one. On its face, as I'm listening to you, it makes a lot of sense, but when a physician is up against the current system where you have what, 15 minutes to be with your patient and you just kind of keep going through patients throughout the day, what's the quality of care? you know, when doctors have one eye on the patient and one eye on the clock, because they have to have that one eye on the clock. Well, it's worse than that. It's actually way worse than what you just said, because what's happened because of electronic health records, whose main purpose has been to allow for maximal billing. Okay, that's the purpose of electronic health records. That's why they, that's why they came into being, is that the doctor has gone from having 12 and a half minutes with the patient, which is actually quite a bit, to be honest, and I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but um, they've done studies that the doc actually has now with electronic health records about a minute and a half to two minutes with the patient. And the other 10 minutes is spent on the, com on the computer. Um, 12 and a half minutes actually is, is a lot if you are experienced and you have a whole 12 and a half minutes. So it's not so much the time, it's what we spend the time on. Um, if what you're getting at is what does an actual practicing doc do these days who has to earn a living and who has to see five patients an hour, that's a different question from a question, let's say, is what would I do if I was going to try and change things, right? Th those are sort of two separate kind of pieces. The patients that you have run into at Laguna Honda were so interesting. And, and these are the poorest of the poor with a myriad of different problems. How does the concept of slow medicine work for the poor and people of color? Well, I have to say, I'm not sure that the color part is, matters very much. At least, I, I don't think it, the poor does, right? Um, but I think a person of color who was wealthy is probably not the same thing as a poor person, just a poor person. I, I'm going out on a limb there. Um, but from my point of view at this hospital, mm, they were very complicated patients um, because they had many diseases. The average patient had about seven or eight serious diseases. And um, many of them had been in prison or on the streets, had psychological problems, had addiction problems. Um, and when they came into the hospital, what happened was it was an old fashioned hospital and they could stay for as long as they needed. And it was that staying that was the most therapeutic thing of all. Um, and that you could say is one part of the slow medicine, this not feeling this chop, chop, get it out, conveyor belt. This is really an unusual hospital. They were all in these open wards and we were kind of over the hill to the poorhouse. Like nobody, nobody paid too much attention. I mean, we had to obey the rules and all that kind of stuff, but they kind of let us alone. And so they let the patients alone. So I saw patients who, many patients, who would come in with unbelievable issues, problems, cancers, diabetes, blind, and they would gradually get better with this nourishing space that let them kind of recover. Because one of the things about slow medicine is it's the essence of it, I think, is that the body wants to heal. The body, by, by its virtue of being alive, has a power of, of, of health. And that if you give it space and you give it time, 
it kind of works itself out. And this happens both not just physically, but even more psychologically, right? Because a lot, really these patients had been wounded. Many, I'm sure if we'd looked, many of them had been, you know, come from broken homes and parents who were alcoholics and addicts and in and out of prison and just messes, right? And they got, in a psychological way, they got re, um, reparented by, by the hospital itself, by the building, by the place, which is immense. And it looked like a medieval monastery. There was almost a million square feet. Okay, with 60 acres of land. So there was this way, so they made their friends. They, they worked things out in a certain way. So that I, as a doc, once I kind of recognized that, I would get a new patient and I would first apply the, 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 what I learned in medical school, doctor's mechanic, take my patient, give them the whole exam, go through, get their problem list, call up their docs, get everything organized. Then once I did that, and then the nurses would kind of do the nursing equivalent, right? So they'd, they'd take care of their wounds or their wounds would heal and they'd, they'd just sort of, things get caught up and the social worker would come in and just everything would sort of start falling into place. And you would see somebody who might be there for six months or a year would get discharged and, and never, never get hospitalized again. I had at least three or four times when I've given these, a talk in different parts of the country, somebody in the back of the over the room, raise their hand and say, he was at Laguna Honda 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It would be just fascinating. So um, I think the of, of color part is that there's a whole added piece that I think contributes to the complexity of that situation. Yeah, that's what I would have to say. The time to heal is interesting. I can't even imagine having the time to heal in our current healthcare system, you know? I mean, you go in for a surgery, you're almost out the next day. Um, oh, you are out the next day. Absolutely. Yeah. However... A day? You go a day? <laughs> you my, know, my brother and one just had a hip surgery. He, he was out the same day. They replaced I, his hip and they discharged him the same day. That must, as, as a physician, that must just drive you crazy. Actually, it was fantastic. It was fantastic because he had a house to go to. He had a sister of mine who's brilliant and caring, right? And actually, it was much better than keeping him in the hospital for a week. Where, that what we used to do, right? Where his hip surgery, then he's going to get the bladder infection and the pneumonia and get the wrong medicine at least once because he's there for a week and they got him mis mixed up with Mr. McGillicuddy. So actually getting out in that situation, I, I'm actually completely approve. But then what? Then what? Right? You, he gets out of the hospital, but that's, that's only when his healing starts. So he gets to be in a healing situation because he has a house. So this goes back to not having places for people to heal. I mean, I think the biggest destruction has been, you know, you're doc in the hospital and you need to discharge somebody. And what do you do when you discharge them to an apartment or to a homeless shelter? We had that happen a lot, or to the street. I, had, I saw people with diabetes out of control who would be discharged the street with their, you know, little box of medicine. I mean, th this is where we fall down. Talking about the time to heal again, though, uh, I'm not the most patient person, nor are most Americans. And, you know, we're yes. bombarded by ads for different medications for any ill. There's a pill for it, right? Um, how can doctors then slow their patients down? Well, I would say where, where you take me with that comment is, is about three different places. So the first one is, um, in general, I think there, there's two kinds of people, two kinds, so two kinds of doctors and two kinds of patients. There's a group of patients that love medicine. They just do. And there's a group of docs that love medicine. But there's a whole other group of docs who don't like medicine and patients who don't like medicine. So part of it is meshing those two. Really, there are... I can think of, yeah, it just is. They, they just like pills. I, I personally can't stand pills, okay? I don't, I don't want a pill. So I go out of my way to not give people pills. I don't like them. They have side effects and they're expensive and they're ass. I don't like them. But I have friends who are very good doctors who they love pills. So I think that's the first place that I go with what you're talking about. But the larger way I think you're talking about it is just a general sense of 
of fastness, you know, chop, chop. I, I, I want something now, make it go away. This instance, this lack of patience, this lack of space, which is again, the mirror from the patient or the person from the society. It's like, there's these, it's the same way that my dad for me was an example of, um, it sort of embodied the whole problem with the healthcare system. Um, that, that chop chopness that we have in our own lives, right? Our own personal lives that we're impatient, not patient. And I think one of the big stresses that's going on right now in general, not just with medicine, is this, this lack of space. You talk about a time to heal. What about the space to heal, right? In your own life, in your own day, in your own 24 hours. Um, a kind of space to move in so that every single thing in your life in a day is not chop chop and you're on your computer and you're on your phone and you're supposed to pick up your kids and you want to read that book and you're going to do th this this ferment um is a general is a general problem and i think it's one of the biggest contributors to the general sense of malaise and discomfort just in general so I think not just of slow medicine, I just think of the concept of slowness in general. And I think of slowness as um, a, 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 a time of how when you, the more you fill up your time, the less time you have. That's it's, true. It's kind of ironic. As we talk about our current healthcare system, physician burnout is a big problem. Why do you think that's happening? What do you tell your students about avoiding it, especially with when we start talking about slow medicine? Yes. Well, you know, one of the things about burnout is I think it's the wrong word uh, for what's going on. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting word, right? Because it means, it, it kind of implies being used up, right? Your energy's burned out. It's like a, a cigarette that's burned up or a fire that's gone out right? Or the embers. Like, and the, the idea behind that is that doctors are exhausted. They've used up all their energy. And the treatment, therefore, if that's the right diagnosis, would be to give doctors more vacations, fewer patients, take some time, do some meditation. But I don't think that that's the right diagnosis. Um, and this isn't my idea. It's a, it was a really... Um, the idea that really what's going on with doctors is moral distress. And the moral distress means that we are being, we are being, our, our morale, our morals are being distressed, torn into two by two different competing demands on us. One is the Hippocratic demand that we concentrate on our patients. And the other one, because we're now a commodity and we have employers and we have the clock ticking, is to prescribe the medicine, get the patient out, see the patient, fill out the electronic health records. And that that distressed, that distress within a doctor that they have to hurry up, get the patient out, get it done, and knowing in their, their heart of hearts they're not doing the right thing. That's moral distress, and that is not going to be solved by meditation, fewer patients, or vacations. That, I think, is the crux of the problem. And the only way it can be solved is by going back and making doctors responsible for their patients and only for their patients. Talk about that a little bit more. They're responsible for their patients, but they are also responsible for filling out their electronic health records to get the most reimbursement for their employer, their group. They're responsible for telling you when you come in. I mean, somebody, I think it was Christine Zinsky, um, has done a study where she, I think it was she, figured out that if doctors um, did every single thing, asked everything, did everything that they're required to do, there's, it would take them 36 hours per patient per year. By the time I asked you about your sex life and your, your work life and told you to do your seat belts and get your pap smear and remember to brush your teeth right and et cetera, et cetera, and do all the exams and do all the tests and... It, it would be, it's impossible. So there's also that whole group of public health activities that doctors are being expected to do on top of their electronic health record stuff and all these layers and layers and layers. Um, I think we need to dial that back and really stop and say, doctors need to be responsible only 
to their particular patient that when you, I think you deserve to know that when you come in my exam room, you have my total attention and my will is on your behalf. And I think if you don't know, know that, then just replace us with robots. You know, I'm interested in your view on end-of-life care, doctor. Um, in your book, you talk about Mrs. C. Interesting case. Uh, the nurses realized she was dying, and she passed the point of no return. And yet the attending physician said her cancer was gone. Uh, it was likely a fungal infection she was dealing with. Don't worry, we'll treat it when we find it. And she's not dying. That's what he told you. She's not dying. But she did. So I'm curious, why do some doctors treat death as a failure instead of the natural life transition that it is? It's a very big question. And I will say that Mrs. C was probably one of the hardest patients I ever had, in part because I was an intern at the time. So this was many years ago. And it was right around the time when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was starting to speak. Um, so these ideas were just starting to percolate. So quite a few decades ago, right? I interesting. When doctors really, you, you literally would not tell somebody they were dying. You literally, if the patient said to you, doc, am I dying? I know I'm dying. You'd say, oh no, you're not dying. You, you, you it was not, it was considered unethical to tell patients that they were dying. So this was maybe 40 years ago when Kubler-Ross started. And of course she was Swiss. And she was appalled because in Switzerland, it was just normal. It was just part of things. Grandma was took to her bed and, you know, then she drifted off and then they washed her and they called the preach, preacher. So Kubler-Ross sort of started the whole thing and Mrs. C was right in the middle of it. So I had been kind of, I'd found her books and it was, I, I'd been sort of, um, I don't know, made aware of this, let's say, by her. So then I was in the middle of this doc uh, and this situation where he was an oncologist. He was a cancer doctor. So of course, he did not like to think. He was very proud of Mrs. C's longevity with her disease. And he, I think psychologically, just for himself, he did feel it was a failure, really, if she died of cancer. So I think there was a personal part, separate from the general um, medical um, reluctance to give up the fight. Um, so for Mrs. C, what I learned, it was when it's only when the nurse came and told me to look at the patient, because I'd taken care of Mrs. C for a couple of months, every day, drawing her blood, resuscitating her because I was not supposed to let her go, and I had to do it because I was an intern. And I kind of stopped seeing her at some point. I literally stopped seeing who she was. And when the nurse grabbed me and sat me down in the, in the call room and said, have you looked at her? Mrs. C is dying. She's never going to get out of here again. She's never going to see her grandchildren again. And I walked back in to the room and I looked at her and I saw she was like a death mask. It was horrible. And then, and then at the time I tried to talk to the doc who was my mentor and it's very hierarchical in medicine and it was even more so back then. And he just blew it off. Um, and so uh, that story was particularly poignant for me because as an intern, my job was to do what my attending said and my attending told me to keep her alive. And by the time I'd taken care of her for two months, I knew how to keep her alive. So for me, the point of that story was for me in particular, I was in this, we're talking about a moral dilemma where I thought keeping her alive was bad for her, but I could keep her body alive. And, I, and, and the real crux was at the family when we asked the family. So docs can get nailed for this, but the really ironic point was that it was the family who said, oh no, you know, Dr. So-and-so says she's gonna get better and so we want you to do everything. So I think in a way it's not doctors, so there's a level of doctors as doctors who don't want to deal with it. But then there's a level of doctors as humans, right? And again, it falls in this kind of continuum. There's a lot of people who are actually very comfortable with death and dying. And then there's a whole bunch of people who aren't. And of course, the more you see of death and dying, like in Switzerland, the more comfortable you are with it as a natural process. 
So I think things have come a long way. And in some ways, I actually worry that we've gone a little bit too far on the other side. Because <clears throat> um, sometimes I think that the only cost-effective patient is a dead patient. And what I mean by that is there's a way in which keeping... I worry that with the corporate takeover, you know, we can go too far in the side. And I'll give you one example. Um, you know, all the do not, you know, so now we, since Kubler Ross, you come in the hospital and we'll ask you your wishes. Right. You know? If you get sick and da da da, you know, do you want this? Do you want that? Right. We get our, your advanced life directives. And in a lot of hospitals now, it's incumbent on you have to do that as a doc. You come in for an appendix, and next thing your doctor's asking you is like, well, what do you want to do if, you know, you have an accident in surgery or whatever. Um, and if you choose what is reasonable, for instance, you say, yeah, do, you know, if, you're, if I'm comatose, don't resuscitate me, and they check off, do not resuscitate. So what I've seen is once that gets on your chart, nobody can figure out the difference between do not resuscitate, DNR, and do not RX, do not treat. So these days, I actually think that the um, pendulum has swung a little too far in the other direction. I, I worry about that. So if you're talking about docs being unable to accept um, death, but healthcare providers have a lot easier time. Interesting. You know, mm. when you, you mentioned advanced care directives, let's talk a little bit about those directives in a, in, a, in a time of COVID, right? So COVID has brought death and dying up close and personal here. Yes, it has. And it's one of the really interesting things about it. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. If a patient or a family pushes for the works, right? I want everything. Sure. I want you to treat me. I want everything. Isn't that their right to ask for that? Well, of course they can ask for it. Um, but I think my duty as a physician is to not do something to you that's bad for you. So if you, it literally is bad for you. So if you were dying terminally ill with cancer, okay, God forbid, uh, and you had like maybe, I mean, you were just, you were dying. It was it, we tried everything, you weighed 92 pounds, it's cancer's everywhere in your body. It's in your brain. You're having seizures. Your skin's breaking down, and your family comes to and your and your kidneys are starting to fail, because that's what happened. And your family comes to me and said, "Doctor Sweet, you said her kidneys failing. Can't she be on dialysis? We want dialysis." I think my my duty, my ethical duty, is to say this is not appropriate for her to have di for her to have dialysis. She's terminally ill. It would cause her nothing but harm and do no good. And you need to hear that from a doc because I, the doc has a sense of that. And, and it's a judgment call, which is why we need doctors to pay attention to their patients, to know their patients, to sit on the bed, look into their eyes and get off the electronic health records. But doctors can't get off electronic health records as long as our whole system is going along the way it is. What do you think of shared decision-making with physician and patient? What else is there? But shared, right? It's, right. You, you know, and you get to, and this again is sort of the art of medicine. You know, if, if I sit down with you and we talk and I, I, you understand whatever it is in your disease, then you can make a really good decision, I think, for yourself. Because I need to hear it from you. Because people are on a spectrum, I think, of fear and pain, tolerance, fear tolerance, and desire for freedom. So one of the things that's really interesting, I think, one of the places where the COVID issue has brought out really interesting for me is to see the difference in risk, um, risk acceptance uh, on this scale. Uh, you know, there's, if, you're, if your chance of getting COVID is one in a thousand, I've had this discussion with numerous friends of mine. There, for, there's a group of people who think, well, whatever I can do, one in a thousand, that's too much. I'm going to lock myself in the house because one in a thousand is too much risk for me to take. And I have other groups of people who say, are you kidding me? One in a thousand, I'm out and about, leave me alone. And then there's everything in between. So the patient who, the, the, the shared decision making is really the patient communicating who they are, 
what, what's important to them. I have, I have a family member who has said explicitly he, he thinks life is so valuable that he would rather be comatose, that if he were comatose and never going to wake up again, okay? Doctors, I mean, no brain left. He still wants to be kept alive in the ICU with all the tubes and stuff. Okay. I mean, we might or not might do that or not, but still that communicates an awful lot about who he is. And the, sh it, the shared part is once I get that, if, if it, I, I know kind of where he stands on that spectrum. It helps my judgment. Let's talk about COVID. And given the success of the slow medicine approaches that you describe in mm. both of your books, how do you apply those concepts in this day and age, the reality of this pandemic? Well, the COVID has been absolutely fascinating to watch as me as a doc because, you know, up until it started, one of my biggest problems when I'd be speaking with, with people or just reading, you know, how Silicon Valley down the block from me is like, you know, literally they were writing things like, we're gonna disappear death and, you know, everything's gonna be on the computer and you don't need doctors anymore. And ever since COVID, I haven't had a single one of that's completely gone. I haven't seen one article like that. It has kind of shaken everybody. I'm like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, what? I could get, I could, I could actually get sick and die. So, so that's been really and really good, I think, in a lot of ways, because that's just, the truth of being alive. And it's one of the big benefits of being a doc is you, you, you see that, you realize that I can get up right now and have a stroke and die. And I know that. So back to the slow thing, that makes this day when I'm not stroked out, incredibly valuable, really valuable. I don't want to fill it with junk. So the COVID piece, so that's one piece of with COVID. I think the thing that hasn't been done with COVID um, but it's sort of ready to be done is if somebody asked me, if you asked me, for instance, Kathy, um, you know, what should I do? What, what's your opinion? What, what, what do I do to protect myself? What do you think about vaccines? What do you think about hydroxychloroquine? What do you think about remdesivir? All these stuff. We could talk about that. But I think what's the most interesting for me as a doc, and I think if I had to sum up everything I believe and know, it's that we live in a sea of germs, okay? I'm right now. There's a there's you, there's more germs right here in my body, right around me, than there are people on the whole planet. Okay, probably than there are molecules. I mean, there's billions and trillions. They're inside me. I'm eighty percent of me is like germs. Okay, germs all around, everywhere, and yet, and yet, I'm healthy. Not those germs aren't affecting me at all. Why not? Well, so we call it the immune system. Right, which is a little bit wonky terms, a little, it's a system, it's immune, what the heck does that mean? But what it means is really there's the, the life within me when it's healthy and whole is your best bet for not getting sick. So when I look at COVID and your risk of COVID and the mask and the this and the that, whatever you want to do, it's okay by me. But the most important thing is to keep that healthiness, that liveliness, that that healthy. And that goes back to how we started this discussion, talking about slow medicine as, and, and as a way to sort of remove what's in the way of that healthy healthiness and the kind of things that are in the way, you know, bad food, bad air, depression, Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merryman. Those three doctors help you kind of identify, you know, diet, not just your food, but your drink and what you put in your body and quiet, not just quiet and that, but activity and merriment, you know, not just your temperament and what you choose to pay attention to, but, um, your entertainment, your activities. So Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merriman. But the most important thing is that detrimental to your physical, your, your health, your life, your protection is the worst thing for it is fear. Absolutely the worst at every level. Okay, and there's many studies that have been shown that chronic fear wrecks your immune system. Okay, and we're living now in a sea of fear. Oh, I mean, sure it's are. just shocking. It's just the worst. So if you were going to ask me, I would say you need to only have your, your fear hit for about 
10 or 20 minutes in the morning. That's what I do. And 10, 20, 10 or 20 minutes in the evening. And for the rest of the day, you need to stay away from it. I love that in terms of the trying to deal with fear because that's we, we are just hardwired for fear as human beings. You're right. And I loved the question that you often ask, what's in the way of a patient's own healing power? And then trying to remove what's in the way. It's hard though. It's really hard. Is it? I think it is. Give me an example. You know, trying to figure out what's in the way of healing. That seems to be a hard question to try to figure that out, don't you think? Or is it, is it something innate? If we just sit down and, and think about it and just slow down, as you say, will the answer come? I, I don't think it's quite that... Um... I mean, we'd have to talk about a particular instance, a particular person, right? But um, it's actually pretty practical. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, um, you know, there, in, in, in God's Hotel, I talked about the, the patient Terry Becker, who was my, you know, she was in her 30s, she was homeless, she lived on the street, she smoked and she drank and she took drugs and she had her boyfriend Mike and... Then she came down with this disease, we don't know why, called transverse myelitis, which is a viral disease which knocks off your spinal cord. So you become paralyzed from, she was paralyzed from the neck down from one day to the next. But it usually gets better over time. We don't know why. So she was, she went to the acute hospital, they diagnosed her, she came to me, us, and um, she ended up leaving and coming and going and ended up with this huge bed sore. I mean huge, like this big, horrible. Right, um, And when I saw her after about a year where she'd been back on the street sitting in her wheelchair and had now developed this huge bed sore, and I was trying to think, figure out what to do with it, it's when I asked myself this question because she tried surgeries and then she'd go back on the streets and, and there, there wasn't anything to do except it had to fill in on its own. And that was going to take a couple of years. So, so when we were at my weird hospital, I knew I had the time. But when I looked at that thing, I said, well... What's in the way of this healing? If I assume that Terry has this natural power of healing and is circulating in her body, then maybe what I need to do with the bed sore is just say, well, what's in the way of that healing? And just march my way. So like one thing was very practical. There was all this yucky tissue. So we had to remove that tissue. So it was all clean, right? And then we had to, she'd been back and forth in the hospital so much. She'd been on the time I got her at the end of this particular year, she was on 26 medications, right? But she probably only needed a few. So they were going to be in the way, right? So I started ta tapering her off the medication. So removing what's in the way. And then in her case, she's, you know, would be lying on it in an uncomfortable bed. So comfortable bed, right? And then I thought, so one is removing what's in the way. And then the other one's nourishing, nourishing this your natural liveliness, your natural healing power. And that's the basics. Fresh air, sunlight, God forbid, right? Um, good food, good drink, rest, sleep. So that's what I did to Terry, and I watched it heal, and it, it was amazing. So there's these two parts, and one of them, the removal, is quite practical. Although I do think medications is one of the things to really look at. I mean, Patients I would get in that hospital would be on an average of between about, I counted up once, 16 and 26 medications. Wow. So removing what's in the way and then nourishing with the basics. Clearly, Terry, using your example of, of this particular woman, it, she had a fascinating story in the book. She also, I think, do you agree, realized she had to get out of this abusive relationship. Yeah, you know? that's true. So that was obviously also in the way of her healing. But you, she had to realize that too, don't you think? Absolutely. That was key, but it, it was part of the healing, but it was also the healing. She had to heal in some ways first. Like when I talked also about this big old hospital was healing in and of itself because it was this big presence and there was all these wards and warrens and people and everybody kind of left you alone and you could kind of find your way. Um, so Terry had to get to the point where she healed enough that she could recognize that the guy was a son of a bitch. And then, dialing that back a little more, that what made her really realize that was she felt loved in that hospital. Not 
felt loved. Like, we love you, Terry. You know, all the marketing stuff. We love you. No, she in fact was loved and she knew she was loved, not for, not for herself, but she was loved as a patient. And she knew she was loved as a patient because she got three meals a day and because she wasn't thrown out on the streets and because people didn't insult her. And so that love, I think, is the biggest healing she had of all because it was the self-love that enabled her to throw, to throw Mike out. Because until she had enough self-love, it's like, who the hell is this guy to beat me up? But she had to think, who the hell is it going to beat me up? So, um, and that's the biggest issue. Like if I look at our society as a whole, I, I think that sense is what you get when you clear up, clear out things in your life and not in your life, but in like today, just this day, like this day, what's beautiful, what's loving, what's fun. And how can I have the most of that? and the least of everything else. When we talk about healing, you also talked in the book, you had a friend who had asthma, and you, mm. there was a, a woman who came in and she was a Chinese medicine practitioner. It was interesting to see what happened with your friend and the asthma. And that person, that practitioner, really helped your friend. Um, how do you think we can bring more non-Western alternate forms of, of healing mm -hmm. into the mainstream? Well, I think the biggest, so, so in that particular case, it was, I was, um, I was a young, young doctor and I had been pretty convinced of the efficacy of fast medicine and body as a machine. And I thought it was a, and I, I really, and I studied and that's what I did. So asthma is a really quite an interesting disease. And this was a friend of mine. Uh, and back then, you know, she didn't have health insurance. So I did all the things I knew how to do. And she just, her asthma just got worse and worse. So that was kind of interesting. We we're getting to the point where she was going to the hospital and she'd get all the medicines and she'd get better for a few weeks. And then the next time she'd get it worse and it was worse and worse. And I felt like there was some way of understanding her asthma. So that, that, it, that I was missing, that I wasn't getting it. And when I ran into this Chinese medical practitioner and I invited her over to Lee's house and I watched her examine Lee and she took the pulses and looked, you know, all this weird stuff, right? Took the pulses and the tongue and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it going like, well, that's pretty interesting. And then she gave her a prescription, which was that she had too much yin and too little yang. So completely different model. And then she gave her, she, you know, she removed what's in the way, which in her case was a bunch of all the medicines I'd been giving her, which, which turned out to be very yin and gave her a bunch of yang to rebalance her. And within 10 days, it was all gone. The asthma was gone and never came back. So that was the story. And what I learned from that is this model of the body, what, what West, non-Western medicine gives us is not so much the techniques and the treatments. It's the perspective. It's this different way of looking at the body that we need in addition we need both of them because what I, what I see these days happening is if we mix up the, the treatments, we can use those treatments, those non-Western treatments. We can use them in a fast medicine way. We can have a clinic where I have a machine that'll find your acupuncture points and literally have a robot put the acupuncture points in and go into the different rooms and put the acupuncture points in. And we can use those and that might be fine as a treatment, but it's not quite I mean, that's all fine, right? But it's still not, it's, it's missing the perspective. This, wow, is there any other way of looking at this problem? One of the interesting things about non-Western medicine, Chinese medicine, Indian medicine, is they, ideally, they use the, um, the actual flower, the actual root, the actual plant, right? But when that is taken into the Western tradition, we try and find what's the active principle. Right? And we want to suck out the active principle, and then we want to synthesize it in the lab, and then we want to put it in a little pill, and then we want to give it to you. And that isn't, might be fine if it's a good medicine, but it, it, it's kind of not what I think we can get from the non-Western way. It's more of this way of thinking. Makes sense. You know, Doctor, we've got some great questions from the audience. 
This is from Rick in Minnetonka, Minnesota. I'm an MD, he says, in specialty practice in the later stages of my career. My partners and I are contemplating selling the practice to a corporate entity, which hopefully will give me the freedom to practice medicine and not have the administrative headaches of running a business. But you say that selling is, quote, selling out and makes us more corporate, more commodified. Why shouldn't we do it if it makes our jobs easier? Look, that's a, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it depends what your choices are. I mean, he's already dealing with immense hassles and frustrations trying to run a business and be in a doc. So he just, I think he would want to get the best deal he can up front in terms of the most freedom he has to do the best he can for his patients, is what I would say. I mean, you know, I never, I never had a private practice because I didn't want to run a business and I worked for the city because they gave me a salary and I was willing to make that trade off. And I think it, he should just, honestly, if you really wanted my advice, I would just make sure from talking to other people who would maybe sold off, sold to that particular company, talk to those docs and find out what they wish they'd put in the contract that they didn't. <laughs> right. I just really, just cause you know, there's nothing wrong. I mean, he's already in the commodification. He's having to make a living and he has to follow all these rules and he has to buy electronic health records and he has to submit forms to millions of different people. It's, it's not a good situation. So sell, just make sure you get a good deal. Mary in Minneapolis says, I'm an RN at a local hospital. How on earth can any nursing be accomplished when every 15 minutes there's a form that needs to be signed and submitted? Well, that is the question of the hour. So I'm going to give you three, three thoughts on it. First of all, I just am in the midst of rereading um, a book from the 60s called Up the Down Staircase. Have you ever heard of it? It's hilarious. It's hilarious. And it's about a teacher and the administration that has descended on the schools. And it is so similar uh, that it's very interesting. So on a person-to-person -person basis, I don't know the answer to that. If I'm a nurse and I'm just getting forms all the time, what, what are you going to do? I mean, the only thing I could say is at least nurses have unions. So I think the, the larger issue is how do we take our medicine back, how do we do that? And I think one way is, I mean, nurses have unions, so why not have the unions say, you know, this isn't good for us. You only get to give us one form every hour <laughs> or we won't work. That's one way to do it, <laughs> you know? Uh, Dan from Minneapolis and other people ask this question. What gets in the way of healing, especially for folks who have felt shut out of the best health care? That could be people in poverty, often people of color. Generally speaking, what gets in the way of, of, of healing as a human being? You know, honestly, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I mean, I, I guess what, this is a terrible, very California thing I'm about to say, and I'm not sure I believe it. But what come up for me when you ask that is karma. What the hell do I mean by karma? Well, if I look at it in the most global sense, what I mean is we come into this world in a situation, in a family, in a body, in a temperament, in a soul, um, and that's kind of what, what we have. And so that, that is really where you, what you have. So what gets in the way of the healing inside of that? There's just, it's like an onion. There can be institutional, there can be temperamental. It's just immense. But to the extent that this guy is suffering and feels not healed, I think that's what I pick up from that question. Maybe time for one more question here. This is from a doctor in Stillwater, Minnesota. He says, many of us MDs want yeah. to sit down and talk with the patient, but the patient just seems to want a, a quick fix uh -huh. of a prescription, you know? Uh -huh. How do we get them to slow down and listen? I think the biggest thing that I learned to do was to sit down with my patient. There's this, this study that really inf influenced me a great deal where they had a sur the surgeon be with the patient five minutes. And the first group of surgeons came to the door of the patient's room and stood there for five minutes. Ah, how you doing? You know, I don't know. The second group of, of surgeons came and stood by the bed, five minutes, and they had a little timer so the patients didn't know what was going on. And then they had the second, third group come and sit on the bed. 
five minutes. And that afternoon, they had uh, psych students come around and interview the patient. Did you see your, your doc today? How long did he spend with you? What kind of visit was it? So the one where he stood at the doorway was like, oh, he was just oh, a couple of minutes, a second, I don't know, he just came by. The one who was by the bed, he's like, I don't know, he's here five or 10 minutes. The one who sat on the bed, oh, he was here, I don't know, 15 minutes. So when you, you, know, you say the patient, I'm sure the patient just wants it, but I think there's a lot we can do to make it clear hmm, from a body sense that that's not where we're coming from. So you walk in the room, if I stand there on a going back and I'm looking at my thing in the computer and I'm here, well, of course the patient's going to want a pill because they, they want to get you to get the pill before, they, before you leave, which you're just about to do, right? But suppose he came in and he sat on the exam table or sat down, you know, a little stool. I used to just sit and say, hi, I'm Dr. Sweet. And with just, it's the same amount of time, six minutes. And I don't mean to be glib because I entirely respect the docs who are there dealing with this. But I do think the sitting down communicates to the patient that we're gonna have a visit. So the patient feels listened to by just sitting down. It's almost like we're an entity. When I sit down, you sit, I sit, we're now an entity, we're a being, and we can have a relationship. It doesn't have to be a long relationship, but it, it creates an expectation on my part that you are not going to just talk about your cough. I would be remiss if I didn't end this with this question, because we'll bring it back to COVID for just a moment, if I could, for a brief answer from you. Do you think the pandemic will do anything to change our healthcare system for the good? Mm. No, I don't. <laughs> what can I say? Why don't I think that? It's, it's, the pandemic has not, no, the, the, ha, has not itself created so far, and it's been going on for six months, much of a stepping back, let's reassess this. It's been going on for six months. Let's reassess our approach. No. What's the approach? It's rush, rush, whirlwind, project warp speed. We need the synthetic fix. We need all this stuff in the pills. And it's just, it's more havoc and more the uh, acme, the fastness cubed. And there's not been anything else. What has to happen to then integrate more of that slow medicine? I actually think what we really need to start with is fairly revolutionary and fairly simple. I think we need to change the law. So the law that the Federal Trade Commission said when it said that medicine wasn't a profession and was a trade and could, could be bought and sold on Wall Street. If you're going to have Wall Street... Be, be able to buy hospitals and do this, then don't be surprised when Wall Street does what Wall Street does. And if you don't like it, change the law. So we need to have, I believe, a very simple law that just says patients, you know, uh, patients are allowed to, or patients must be able to know that when their doctor takes care of them, it's only f for their benefit. Something that just puts it right back and any, so then we get the law, then we sick, we have a law like that, and then we sick the lawyers to start going, well, then all these companies have to make sure that really the doc gets to do that and the patient gets to know that. So I think we need a law. I wish I had more time with you. Dr. Victoria Sweet, thank you so much for the conversation. It was enlightening. It was engaging. And we really appreciate you being here at the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Well, thank you so much for having me and in this context where I really did get to feel like we had a real interview and I wasn't like sitting there like this. I'm so pleased. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. Dr. Victoria Sweet is the author of Slow Medicine, The Way to Healing. Also, she's the author of God's Hotel, A Doctor, A Hospital, and a Pilgrimage to the Heart of Medicine. This has been the Westminster Town Hall Forum, sponsored in part with a generous grant from the George Family Foundation. I'm Kathy Worzer with MPR News. Thank you so very much for listening.